In the previous section, we described data transfer types and considerations in an RT application. By the end of this module, you'll be able to identify modules, performance requirements, and reliability requirements in an RT application. So, what is a module? A module is going to be a functional grouping of code that may be called by one or more processes. If you like, your process is a loop, your modules are the code that goes within that loop. So, examples would be memory maps, data transfer mechanisms, config mechanisms, file managers, protocols, instrument drivers, anything and everything that your system is going to do is probably going to be done within a module. Ideally, your modules are going to have certain characteristics of good software design that will make them more reusable and easier to maintain. So, just like any of the other code that you write, your modules should have high cohesion. By that, they should stick together. They should all do one thing and do one thing well. If you have a set of code that is doing five different things at once, that probably shouldn't be a single module. That's not very high cohesion. You should also have low coupling. And by that we mean low amount of reliance on the calling process or other modules. It should stand alone as much as it can. It shouldn't depend on something else being there or being initialized, or passing in a reference handle, or giving you some input data if you can't avoid it. This makes it good for unit testing, and also good for debugging. If you've ever had to debug a monolithic, giant super diagram of LabVIEW with no sub-VIs in it, with seven different loops, and something somewhere is sometimes going wrong, it's not a fun exercise. If you have things broken up into well-maintained, highly cohesive modules that aren't coupled to each other, you can narrow down the problem pretty quickly, reproduce the problem with just a simple unit test, and hopefully find and fix that problem much faster. It will pay dividends, even though it requires you to do a little bit more work up front. As part of that, we want you to encapsulate similar operations. My general rule of thumb is if you are writing the same code twice, you're probably doing it wrong. If you're writing the same code three times, come on, you can do a little bit better than that. That's the point where I will go through and make a sub-VI out of it. See if there's groups of related sub-VIs that need to be used together. Those will probably get grouped together as a module. So how do we do that grouping? Typically we're going to implement these modules in one of two ways, depending mostly on your preference. And those are going to be as slabby project items. So you could just group them as a virtual folder within your project. So an example of the screenshot here, the error handlers or globals folder within the project. That's okay. It's good for organization while you're coding. Not as good for distributing that code to someone else or making it more maintainable. Typically, I'm going to recommend that if you have groupings of related code that stick well together and can stand by themselves, then you should probably make that into an LVLib, or, if you are so inclined, to make it into a LabVIEW class. The LabVIEW library, LVLib file, uh, for example, messageq.lvlib in the screenshot, this is going to contain the type definitions and methods needed to work on a similar set of data, in this case the message queues. It provides your users and yourself with an API to call into this functionality. The idea is that if you're doing the same type of operation, if you're calling into messaging queues, you probably want to do it in a standard, consistent way throughout your code so that you don't have to deal with surprises later. So that if you find a problem in one usage, you can fix it for all usages without having to search through your code. That gets very tedious very fast. If you choose to use a LabVIEW class for implementation, you do get access to a number of benefits of an object-oriented approach. A trade-off is that you then have to make sure that those who are intended to use this code are familiar with object-oriented programming and can work with those paradigms. It's a trade-off. There's not a wrong way or a right way to work with them. It's a matter of what the needs of your system and your team are. An alternative to using LabVIEW project items to group together this different functionality is a functional global variable. In these cases, rather than having a separate VI for each function you wish to call, it is possible to wrap all that functionality into a single VI 
that is exposed to a user. Typically, where all they need to wire to it is a command. So typically an enum of what function you want that functional global variable to undertake and some inputs and outputs from it. I'll talk a little bit more in a later lesson about some caveats of functional global variables, but they can be a very easy way to get functionality replicated throughout your system. Besides identifying your modules, it's also very important when designing your real-time application to identify your performance requirements. Typically, there's going to be two high-level requirements that we need to care about. Those are going to be determinism and response time. Determinism is how wide of a range we have between when we expect the operation to execute and when it actually does. So you can see in the graphic here, we have a desired loop time. This will be how long we expect this loop to take to iterate. And you also notice a jitter range. That jitter range is essentially the plus or minus value. If we say that a loop is going to take 50 milliseconds plus or minus 2 milliseconds, that jitter range would be plus or minus 2 milliseconds. Typically on a real-time system, we want to reduce the jitter range as much as possible and therefore have a high amount of determinism. High determinism means we're very sure that an operation is going to execute at this time and complete at this time. The response time is not how sure are we of when it's going to finish, but how quickly after asking it to start will it actually get started. An example would be if we are sending an emergency stop command to a motion system. You definitely want that response time to be very fast because there might be a giant robot arm swinging towards your head. Obviously, you don't want it to take a long time to realize that you've been mashing that big red button. I'll be using that example a bunch because it's one of my favorites, so keep an eye out for that. One way we can improve the determinism in the system is to separate out deterministic and non-deterministic tasks. Typically, you're going to have a deterministic process within your system, a time-critical loop, for example, and other loops at lower priorities that can wait if they need to. Those are going to be the, where you put your non-deterministic tasks, such as network access, file I.O., waiting on operations, waiting on commands, etc. For response time, that's when you're probably going to want to have things that need to have a fast response time in a deterministic loop, in one of those high priority loops, that is going to get CPU cycles away from other loops if they don't need it. So besides what needs to run and how fast it needs to run, we also need to consider reliability. How long is it going to survive out in the field? How long can it run without maintenance? So this is going to be one of the most important topics in any embedded system design. And unfortunately, it's one that a lot of people don't think about until after they've already completed the design of the system. It's often an afterthought, and that's very dangerous. Because if you're dealing with an application where the consequences of failure are very high, Thinking about reliability is something that should happen first. Not, oh, I've finished all the functionality, it seems to work, and now I'll figure out how I can make it not crash on me. Not good. You want to make sure that your system is robust and reliable from the beginning. But you also need to have a trade-off. You don't want to spend so much time making a bulletproof system if it doesn't need to be that reliable. So some considerations. How long must it run? And typically that means unattended. So if this is a system that needs to run for an hour, and then you could reboot it or shut it down and then you're done, probably doesn't matter as much in terms of reliability. If this is a system that's going to be put inside of a pressure vessel of an autonomous submarine and sent to the bottom of the ocean for three months, you probably want to make sure that you don't need to hit the reset button because that's going to be quite difficult. So that goes into accessibility. Can you get to the reset button? Is it sitting on your bench top in a PXI chassis and will always be sitting right next to you? Okay, if so, you can reach out and press that reset button. If it's in the Gobi Desert and you are based in California, it's probably not going to be very convenient for you to go over there and press that reset button. If it's on the bottom of the ocean, also not convenient. Another part of this is failure analysis. We'll talk more about this in a later lesson as well. What failures could happen and how should the application handle them? Also known as, what's the consequences of failure? If something happens, what are you going to do about it? Are you able to simply reboot the system automatically? Great. Do you have to put it, perhaps, into a safe state? 
so that if it does need to stop performing its task, it puts all of its outputs at a good level. For example, in my favorite motion control example of the robot arm of death, if this thing is moving very fast, has been commanded to move very fast towards me, I probably want the application when I shut it down by pressing that big red button to not keep whatever motion parameters it was given. Probably don't want it to keep moving. Probably want it to stop. I want it to save all of its motors, stop moving, and put itself into a good state until I command it to do otherwise. And similarly, if you're dealing with an industrial process control application, your shutdown procedure might include shutting off your valves so that you don't have gas and oil and flammable things flying around your process. Probably not good. If you are a concrete plant, you probably don't want to keep the concrete flowing into your basin if it's already overflowing. If you're dealing with an application where safety is a concern, if life or machinery is at risk, it's very important to have a safe shutdown procedure thought of in advance and a way to implement that. We'll talk about that in a later lesson, but I wanted to get it on your mind now. Now you can identify modules, performance requirements, and reliability requirements in an RT application. Coming up next, we'll describe considerations when choosing an appropriate RT target for your application. In the previous section, we identified modules, performance requirements, and reliability requirements in a real-time application. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe considerations when choosing an appropriate RT target for your application. When you're trying to decide what RT target to use, what hardware that you need to run your application on, there's a number of considerations that you'll need to take into account. One of the topmost amongst these is performance. Can you meet your requirements, such as the loop rate? Can you acquire enough data fast enough? Similarly, size of hard disk. Okay, you've acquired that data. You have enough places on disk to put it. If you're dealing with a RF stream to disk application, probably are not going to go with an embedded target that only has a few hundred megabytes of storage. Probably going to want to go with a bigger PXI system, perhaps with the RAID array inside. Other considerations is going to be the size of the hardware. If you're putting something inside a pressure vessel going to the bottom of the ocean, you probably don't want five PXI chassis stacked on top of each other. Probably going to want to go with something smaller. And it may even need to be a consideration of do you have room for a four slot or an eight slot within the system. And that can also lead into what individual acquisition modules you need. If you need to fit it into four slots, you may make different choices than if you had eight slots to play with. Also need to think about ruggedness. Is a target located in a harsh environment? Is it going to be sitting on your bench top right next to you in a nice air conditioned room with climate control for the entire year? Or is it perhaps going to be sitting out into an industrial process facility where there's a very wide temperature range harsh environment, perhaps it needs an IP rated enclosure to make sure that there's no dust or moisture or liquid getting in, perhaps it's in a high vibration and shock environment, perhaps it's mounted to an aircraft, it needs to handle whatever the aircraft can handle. That'll be one other consideration you need to think about. Other thing to keep in mind is going to be symmetric multiprocessing capability. And basically, does the application require multiple simultaneous deterministic loops? Do you need to dedicate a core to more than one task on the system? If you need that, then you're going to need multiple places to run your code. I mean, the single core system may not be sufficient. Along the same theme, considering do you need more than one RT target, or perhaps an expansion chassis? The usual reason for this is going to be channel count. Say you need to read from 4,000 thermocouples probably not going to be able to do that in a single compact radio chassis. You're probably going to need more resources, more modules, more slots, more processing power, more FPGA space, more PXI horsepower to process all this data. 
Other consideration would be if you need to acquire data as close as possible to the data source, you may need to split your acquisition into multiple locations, say a location 10 meters away from another location. It may be difficult to run wire that long in terms of, say, thermocouples or running measurement leads, but it may be quite simple to have an expansion chassis with an Ethernet interface spanning that distance. Another reason may be if you wish to implement a redundant uh, real-time system, such that when one system fails, another one is present and available to take over. All these things are things you should think about before placing an order or starting the design process and in any more detail. So what are your options? Well, since NI releases a new product on average about every business day, the list is going to be growing. I suggest you refer to NI.com for detailed descriptions and specifications of all the currently available real-time targets. And some things you'll want to consider, of course, the I.O. count, the dimensions, the ruggedness, typically temperature, vibration, and shock ratings, and the loop speed that you need to attain on the system. So you might want to go for a nice 18-slot PXI chassis if you're looking to do RF record and playback. If you're looking for an embedded data logger that can withstand a huge degree of punishment and only has a small number of channel count, we're probably going to go with a compact Rio system. If you need something that has the tightest possible dimensions and lowest cost, you're probably going to go with a single board Rio system. It all depends on what your application is designed to do. So now you can describe some considerations when choosing an appropriate RT target for your application. Next. We'll describe considerations for the host interface of your real-time application. In the previous section, we described...